As we do each week, I light a candle on your behalf here on our worship center. It is for us a traditional representation of the life of Christ who brings us illumination and insight in our lives. It is said that uh, it only takes, you know, the lighting of a match to um, in, um, chase away the darkness. Um, it is in this sense also that we have in our tradition uh, the understanding that Christ is the light of the world. We know also that Jesus said to us through our tradition, you are the light of the world. And it is our understanding that when this candle goes out or is extinguished at the end of our service after providing its time and its uh, offering to us, we um, are the persons who take the light out into the world and uh, do that with our ministries and our love for one another. I'm also going to light again the, a rainbow candle. Uh, today, as you note in the bulletin, is um, the Sunday before Transgender Day of Remembrance. And it is uh, our um, custom to um, note that as a part of our worship service on the Sunday before or the Sunday of or the Sunday immediately following, whichever is closest. So I will light that candle, keeping in mind the hundreds of trans persons who have been killed. That's what Transgender Day of Remembrance is meant to help us do. It's a memorial day for transgender persons. Those who have been killed for simply doing the best they could to be who they know that they authentically are. Um, I'm also noting that in the great diversity of God's creation, we can also light this candle which if we remember that the, the rainbow is, is, is God's symbol to God's self of an end to violence against creation. And so it is also appropriate to light this candle, uh, remembering all the persons, including the most recent, who have been victims of gun violence uh, in our society. I welcome you to Bloom in the Desert Ministries, United Church of Christ and Reconciling Ministries Congregation. We are a group of people gathered 17 years ago and growing uh, in, uh, with the purpose of uh, doing our best to live out the modern motto of the United Church of Christ, which says, whoever you are and wherever you are on the journey of faith, you are welcome here. Uh, as we do each week, we welcome people from the broad diversity of perspectives and creation that God has established with this earth. We know that we come from a variety of um, uh, per, uh, educational and, and uh, financial and political and geographic perspectives. We know that we love one another in various ways. We welcome people who are straight and gay and lesbian. We know that in God's creation, there is a continuum, not a binary set uh, according to gender. And we welcome people who are transgender, people who are uh, non-binary, people who are non-gender declaring, and people who are cisgender. It is our purpose to welcome everyone uh, we know that in God's creation, there are people all around the planet and right here who are black and white and red and yellow and brown. And we know that there are varieties of ages and varieties of ableness. And in every way, we are doing our best to welcome people as you see yourself from the inside out and not an identity that we would foist upon you. And so that means um, you are welcome here. So now is when we go from being gathered to being scattered. We have been assembling here, coming from our homes, coming from um, our places of habitation. Uh, we've been gathering here as a unique um, group of people in this particular place on the planet for this particular time. And so we can rejoice in the unique nature of what we are experiencing and the gifts that we are giving one another as we are here today. Let us uh, 
bring together as people have done for many, many years, our full selves, our hearts and mind and strength, and uh, our hearts, mind, strength, and hearts, mind, strength, everything, <laughs> and worship God uh, together. As you're able, please rise and join me in reading the responsive call to worship. We are here to renew our souls with the benefits of faith, hope, and love. We gather in appreciation for what we've experienced and our ministries ahead. We are ready to build skills for harvesting the healthy resources and to build strength for our journeys, and we are thankful. Loving God, we come here for the living water and spiritual food that provide nourishment and security and faith. Fill us with your blessings so we create shalom, salam, ping on, pause, peace, amen. This is the time in our worship when in faith we open our hearts to ministry with our prayer for good and growth. On this Sunday before Transgender Day of Remembrance, we welcome God's spiritual embrace. Together we say, God, the vast varieties of humankind, 
help us to move beyond the exclusiveness of a neither or mentality to the inclusiveness of an all and every way of thinking. Move us beyond binary definitions to the mystery and complexity of your infinite creativity and creation. As we pause to remember persons senselessly murdered because of their all-encompassing humanity, open up all hearts that need to hear, all souls that need to know, all minds that need to think, and all eyes that need to see, there are no limits to you nor your creation. Holy Spirit, move us to let go of ways we confuse gender roles with your love for us, toward being ourselves and helping others to be themselves. Move us to new life and community with all transgender and gender non-conforming people across the world. Move us to new relationships with people around us, free to cast aside the ties of stereotypes and hierarchies. Move us to a world where trans people are employed, valued, housed, loved, and honored. Eternal creator of grand diversity and limitless love, receive now our silent prayers. To all our silent prayers, let the people say amen. amen. Some days are better, some worse. Look for the blessing instead of the curse. Amen. amen. Let us now receive the word. This morning, the Hebrew scripture reading is from the book of Isaiah. Chapter 65, verses 17 through 23. For I'm about to create new heavens and new earth. The things of the past will not be remembered or come to mind. Be glad and rejoice forever and ever in what I create. Because I now create Jerusalem to be a joy and his people to be a delight. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in my people. No more shall the sound of weeping be heard in it or the cry of distress. No longer will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days or old people who do not live out their days. They die as mere, they die as mere youths who reach but a hundred years and those who fall short of a hundred will be thought accursed. At last they will live in the houses they build and eat the fruit of the vineyard they plant. They will not build for another to inhabit. They will not plant for another to eat. For the days of my people will be the days like the days of a tree, and my chosen ones will enjoy the fruit of their labors. They will not labor in vain or bear children doomed to die, for they and their descendants are a people blessed by God. Here ends the Hebrew scripture reading.
Please rise as you are able for the reading of the gospel. The gospel reading today is from the book of Luke, chapter 21, verses 5 through 8. Some disciples were speaking of how the temple was adorned with precious stones and votive offerings. Jesus said, you see these things? The day will come when one stone won't be left on the top of another. Everything will be torn down. They asked, when will this happen, Rabbi? And what will be the sign that it's about to happen? Jesus said, take care not to be misled. Many will come in my name saying, I am the one and the time is at hand. Don't follow them. Here ends the reading of the gospel. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. Thanks, Thanks be God. God. Amen. Let us pray. Continue to bless us as you have so abundantly to this moment. We are grateful for all the music and the readings and the energy that has been brought to this place with the complete focus of caring for you and caring for one another. We express our love in both. We are thankful, loving God, that among all of these words, we know that the word you have for each one of us is what will be able to make it through the words we sing and say and think and hear and express. Let it be that that word, that logos, that logic, that presence of Christ is what we know inhabits us and we take with us as we leave here and share with others. We know that people have gathered like this for many, many years. They brought together their strength and soul and mind and heart. We know also that the psalmist prayed and we pray like that, that as we are gathered, it will be a time that is acceptable to you, the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. The promise that God relayed through to us through Isaiah in that passage that was just read by Ron is a core component supporting all of the acts of our faith. I, you know, as I do occasionally, I encourage you to take this bulletin home with you and to cut this passage of Isaiah out and put it up on your refrigerator and to read it to yourself and to your family and to anybody who will listen whenever you feel the need to do that. We've heard similar messages from media campaigns and we hear this now from the ancient writings. Something will happen and life is going to get better. The promise gives us hope in troubling times and substance for joy in good times. We all know the political news that we hear and read is relentless. Whatever good news we can hear may be quickly overwhelmed by the grist of the 24 hour news cycle grinding on and on. And now in order to sell more ad spots, it's being divided into smaller and smaller blocks that repeat again and again and again. They say the news cycles are shorter now, so we maybe shouldn't feel as uh, hit by them, but the drumbeat goes on and on. This is not new from a standpoint of the what's being reported. It's not new. History is full of pressure-filled, tumultuous times. 
dealing with them as communities and individuals is the story of historical legends and the product of modern self-help writers. My family oral history passed from the older to my younger generation had many stories of farm disasters, world wars, deaths, and the biggest one of all, the Great Depression. And as I look back on them, on those stories, on the people telling them, I observe that perhaps one key to their surviving and later thriving is that they did not have cable news <laughs> or opinion shows, nor the internet to haunt them. But it does not really help for me to say that because we do, Blanche, we do. <laughs> so what can I talk about in these days when the topics of life can seem so challenging? Let's remember our elder loved ones and what they might say to us in times like this. Let me introduce to you one person and remind you of another whom I trust to remind me how to face tough times and the sad days and come out still having hope and joy in my heart. The first is Mrs. J. A. Beersticker, also known as Augusta May Reinhardt also known as my Aunt Gussie. Aunt Gussie attended La Crosse Wisconsin Teachers College and taught school in North Dakota and Wisconsin. She did this prior to her marriage in 1915. After that, she lived in Eau Claire, my hometown, Eau Claire, Wisconsin, raised two daughters with her traveling salesman and suspected philandering husband. <laughs> he was named John, but family just always called him Uncle Jack. In order to secure household finances with a little something left over, Aunt Gussie maintained a rooming house full of boarders and sold parakeets and canaries. <laughs> She became the family matriarch after her mother, Great Grandma Reinhardt, died. Aunt Gussie bought property on her block for rental houses and her daughter's future homes. They tell me she liked controlling people. <laughs> Augusta May Reinhardt Beerstecker was born in the 1800s before World War I and lived through World War II. She was someone I saw on a very regular basis because family occasions and occasional consults revolved around her home's front rooms and the screened-in front porch that had very comfortable wicker furniture. She always wore sensible shoes, either black or white, and a house dress but got pretty dressed up for church and parties. She's the only one in our stream of family who converted to Roman Catholicism as a result of her marriage to Uncle Jack. She stored a hanky in her bosom. I hope that's not TMI. <laughs> and kept a comb in her white hair. And whenever she was sitting down, there was a black and white Boston Terrier in her lap. She died in the nursing home sometime during the Vietnam War and had two funeral services on the same day, each in different counties. When you lived with her during World War II, part of your rent was to turn in your ration coupons. Yes, there was rationing in that war here in the good old USA. These years are remembered by some as the good old days. Well, as bad as things got in the good old days, Aunt Gussie had a useful phrase that helped her through her most difficult moments. She also recited the phrase to others as counsel when they were complaining to her or crying on her matronly shoulder. The salve she would apply to someone's hurts comes from her German background, old German background, it was a saying, something she repeated time and time again, taint so bad. 
The taint, so bad. My mother, who became the matriarch after Aunt Gussie passed away, lived through two seven-year cycles of my father's alcoholism. During World War II, she worked in the munitions plant making bullets for the boys overseas. Her workplace was the converted Presto pressure cooker factory in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. And when the boys came home from the war, all the girls got sent home. For three years during the war, my mother and my young sister lived with Aunt Gussie. For a short time after the war, they lived there with my dad. He got the picture and was quick to decide it was time to move on. But my mother was afraid because Aunt Gussie tried to get her to stay. There were still ration cards, and my dad later said he thought Aunt Gussie did not want to lose that food access. But they moved out, my sister and my mother and my dad, to a little upstairs apartment on the edge of town called Seymour. My family beginning heritage was very humble. More than a decade later, after building a new home and having two more children, both boys, one being this surprise tag-along baby, she lost her eight-year-old firstborn son to kidney disease. Only little Rexy's body left the family, though. His presence is still with my sister and me. And in a happier time, five years later, her daughter, my sister, married a college graduate, Marine officer candidate, and entered the life of being a Marine wife, moving somewhere, almost, somewhere new almost every three years. And when my sister called my mother from one post or another, talking about how tough it was to make those moves, to be in a new place, to have to meet all new people, and to get the children enrolled in new schools, my mother would say something to her that helped her and all of us emotionally, occasionally. The phrase would let pressure escape and we could feel better for the time being. It must have been something that my mother also thought for herself on many occasions. And the phrase was, it's not forever. It's not forever. I remember finding comfort when she said that to me as I was experiencing a tough time of setbacks, trying to make a go of it in the Chicago business world. It's not forever. Whenever we're experiencing whatever we're experiencing in the moment of difficulties, it's not forever. Those short and simple phrases from my family matriarchs give the advice I sometimes consult as they come from two witnesses in the cloud of family heritage that I carry in my life. I imagine many of us in this room have some of their same. What can we remember? What can you remember? And what might someone be remembering from us? Now today we look back on the ancient words of this gospel reading, and we must remember that Luke was looking back as he recorded these words attributed to Jesus who we love and who loves us back. Luke knew all the things that had happened since Jesus left the planet from the Mount of Olives outside of Jerusalem. And after Luke's friend Paul started co-founding house churches among the Greek population in the northern Mediterranean Sea areas, the predictions being made and the observations made by Jesus that, can, that are being made can be applied to any age even ours. Many theological writings focus 
a lot on this passage. They focus on learned observations that teach that the religion of Jesus would supersede the religion of the temple. They see a prediction that the big impressive system of religious and economic control in Israel that the temple represented would soon tumble down, regardless of how revered or feared it was, it would not last forever. Roman conquerors saw to that as the day of destruction came, or the days of destruction came 40 years after Jesus left the planet. Someday, in some days, the good that Isaiah promises will be with us. As we look for meaning in our faith, to help in our lives, let's always remember that we share some of the same promises that even Jesus was banking on. In the Isaiah scripture reading today, those are words that Rabbi Jesus himself would have known. When he talked about the temple crumbling, it is credible to think that he was doing so with firm knowledge of the past promises of God found among the great prophets of the time. Life is not lived in vain because, to put it simply, as Aunt Gussie said, taint so bad. The Jesus reference to temple walls falling can be for us a reference to hope, not destruction. The promise about whatever is getting us down or controlling our lives, it's not forever. Even if it lasts our whole lives, that is not forever. We are people who live in a faith that spends its time on an eternal continuum. As people of the new covenant, we can overcome the pressures of our time. As resurrection people gathered around a common table, we can help each other rise above whatever is getting us down. The songs of our Bloom Tones Choir, the songs that are being sung today go along with the scripture wisdom. You can be anybody. And later, anywhere you go. They go along with the spiritual wisdom of our scriptures as it unfolds. And the expressions of love and kindness that we make to each other in this place and in our other places and in our world are in concert with the promises of God that we need not let events of our time get us down. That weekly and eternal blessed assurance is one of the main reasons we are gathered. And it also is reason we invest in our ministries together. That kind of support in our faith and our faith in one another is what will help us get through to the other side. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. As we prepare today to do our uh, dedication of our stewardship offerings, those of you who are present, if you have a commitment pledge form, uh, please uh, pass it to the center aisle and usher will come forward and collect those and bring them up before we do the litany. So if you have one in your hand, pass it to the center aisle and Jack will catch it. For those of you watching on Facebook, you're, you're invited to also make a commitment and pledge to the um, support of this congregation in 2020, and we can take those by email or uh, Facebook donation, uh, donation on our website page or note in the mail to us. The work and ministry of this church depends on the support of everyone who benefits from it. The dedication litany is in an insert in your Sunday bulletin.
please respond with the um, bold print. Bloomin and Debtors of Ministries began with planting of seeds years ago. We have grown and added more seeds to our mission for this community. Today, we add more seeds of various kinds to reflect our continuation of good works and our openness to opportunities for the future. Through our combined generosity, our gathering of seeds overflows. From the resources God has provided in abundance, we return with those financial covenants a generous share of our funds. We trust that they will be used wisely and effectively for carrying out our commitment to the future life of our congregation. From the many hours and days of our lives and abilities we have, we covenant to share our time and talent in so many ways. We know that the efforts of all, our service to this church, and our local and wider community will be fruitful. Together, we bless these gifts, saying, Creator and living God, we receive these gifts and acknowledge the gratitude of each person who has made a covenant for 2020. We anticipate others in our community will support us as they are able in the year ahead. We dedicate all that is offered for mission and ministry of Bloom in the Desert. Amen. Let us pray. Precious Lord, thank you for this opportunity to dedicate these gifts as we become bold in our faith and slow in our judgment. Let your stream of living water flow from our lips as we share your good news. Amen. Amen. And we will pray together the prayer that is given to us from Jesus using the words that are most familiar and comforting to you, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. 